Right, so you are listening to In Conversation With, with myself, Colm, and as always, I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Mr. Gavin Kelly. How you doing? And Mr. Greg Mulhall. How are we today, lads? Greg, can we give you a little congratulations at the start of the show? Oh, wow, like, imagine they turn around and like, we're like, actually, do you know what, that contract we just promised you? Post-production is a fine thing. Post-production. Uh, go on, go on, tell us. Yeah, I, uh, I went for an interview yesterday, um, and I, I didn't actually get the job I went for, um, but they created a position for me. So, um, yeah, I have my, my, my foot in the door of media industry. And, um, what's, the, what's the title? It's, it's kind of a hard one to say. I'm interim sports editor for a couple of months. That might change to sports editor, or as my contract will say, I'll go to part of the digital hub team. Okay. So uh, that's, that's, yeah, I got the news literally uh, only about an hour and a half ago. I was on the Lewis. I had to step off, and um, once I got off the phone with him, I let out a big massive scream, which, considering I was outside the, the forecourts, yeah. Lewis stopped, probably, you know, wasn't the, the smartest move. Did get quite a few looks from people dressed in their, you know, formal attire. But, um, yeah, fuck it. Your first, first, yeah. first full, full-time role in Irish in, media. Yeah, yeah, so, um, look. Very good, a little, a little clap for Greg. <laughs> yeah. well, well. People make me blush. <laughs> um, before, I know you're, I know you're eyeing up for your usual first question, but um, well, let's introduce the guest first. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry Joining us today is the um, CEO of DCU Sport, Mr. Ken Robinson. How are you, Ken? I'm good, Colin. Good to see you. Thanks very much for joining us. Pleasure. And Greg, you said you wanted to interject before I asked the first yeah, question. Yeah. So I know our usual first question, which will now be our second question. Mm. Ken, what's the dimensions of this room? Oh, that's a great. I would say this room here is probably just shy of about eight hundred square feet. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to disagree with. Greg. We're, we're going to get <laughs> the building plans, and we're going to see. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely get onto that little tidbit. <laughs> That'll be explained later. But uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll start like I traditionally do, Ken. Um, and again, this this came via Ross. So a big thanks to Ross Munley and the alumni office for setting this one up. Uh, but what was the initial thought when Ross asked you to come on this podcast? Well. I'm 14 years or so in DCU, so any time a student body have ever asked, can I help them out in any way to help them with their experience, it's always a yes straight away. Yeah, so fair I enough. Mean, I know, mean, yeah, it's been, it's been a consensus answer for a lot of people. Yeah, that, and that, that would be it. You're, look, be you're it. looking to give back, yeah. yeah um, so we'll dive straight, in, dive straight into it. Um, but we'll, go, we'll go back to the very, very start. The very start. You're a Fairview boy. Yeah, I'm actually from, Fairview was probably the posh way of saying it, I was from Clonliffe Avenue, okay. which was technically Ballybock. Mm -hmm. So when you went down our street, if you went right, you went to O'Connell's, but my mother decided to push me left, so I went to Fairview to Joey's. Oh, to Joey's. So that's where I went to Joey's in Fairview. So Fairview School, made my communion in Fairview Church, went to Joey's, and then for sixth class left and went to Mary's in Mullingar. Okay, yeah. okay. So and that, then you would have done your secondary school education. Secondary school in Mullingar, yeah. And sorry, even though I'm a dub, I would sort of say my spiritual home is, Westmead. like, you know, yeah, when you're driving home, you, you know, you feel like you're driving home when you're driving to Westmead. Mm. So okay. it's, it's always a nice feeling. My best pal for 40 years this year is still down there. So, um, yeah, it's sort of my, my spiritual home. A lot of you connections. Grow, growing yeah. up uh, in and around the Fairview area, like maybe setting the pace for what, what was to come in terms of like regular trips to Croke Park, I'd say, every, yeah. all the time. Yeah, my, my abiding memory when I was about nine was my dog getting stolen by some person going to the match from me or something, because me were playing that day, and the dog went missing on Sunday afternoon and came back Monday evening drenched and tired and slept for two days. So I was one of those dubs that, you know, I, I grew up in the 70s, Dublin doing well in 74, first All-Ireland final 76, I went to 77. But um, yeah, it was people parking outside our, our house and my dog going missing, so that, that was my big memory. <laughs> I suppose you never had much love for the, for the Mead crowd anyways, so that well, certainly didn't help. It's funny, you know, it, without getting too sort of, you know, um, sort of pointed in this, my father's buried in Mead, right? okay. so we lived in Mead. After West Mead, we went back to Mead, uh, I was slowly making my way back to Dublin, so that, that was eventually, my, that's my excuse got, there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I actually live uh, just off Fairview, I ah, live there right. in Marino. Um, I live with a 90 year old man in Diggs Brilliant. and he actually went to Joey's. Did he? Really? He did. Uh, I think well before you now, yeah. probably. But, uh, but that's, and Joey's, like he would have gone to school maybe with Charlie Hahi and Desi Ferguson and Oliver Freeney. Like Joey's was a class school at then. At you know, then. And, and it's probably like Sing Street. It goes through a bit of a cycle. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, that would, would have been a really 
Ivy League secondary school back it in, been, in his time. Yeah, you know, he you said know. himself it was considered a very good school. It was, yeah. We did entrance exam. You know, yeah, you he, did, he yeah. talked about the entrance exam. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Entrance exam on a Saturday morning to see what class you go into for a second class, mm. you know, it was a bit strange, but it yeah. was a good school. Great sporting pedigree as well, you know. That's where he said he learned how to hurl, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And then, he, funnily enough, he actually went on to work with Jimmy McGee in British Rail, did straight out of school. So the two of them would have started at the same time and they would have worked together for a good few years. Wow. Jimmy. Wow. But I think that's great as well when you look at, I think something that's missed in society now is that 90 year old living with somebody who's played 21, 22, whatever, to give those sort of Shanna Key type stories. Oh, back yeah. then. I'm like, loving it. Like, yeah. I, I've, I've said it before, my grandparents would have died on my, my mom's side before I was born and my dad, or sorry, my dad's side before I was born, my mom's side when I was probably four or five. So yeah. I never really got yeah. to get that experience. So Tom is my first experience of a granddad, brilliant. really. That's brilliant. Uh, That's great. We, call, we call him my Diggs granddad. Yeah. Diggs you know. granddad. Share a can of Guinness uh, with me. We have a can of Guinness every night. Occasional night whiskey if you're feeling a bit frisky. I rarely go for the Jemmy Chaser now, but Tom yeah. would have the Jemmy Chaser if the stories are, are rolling. Yeah. You know? That's a great story. And that's given him such a resurgence of life. Oh, he loves telling me these. Yeah. It's brilliant though, isn't it? Really is. It is indeed. It's great. So what was it like moving to Mullingar then? Shocking at with, the time. With a dub accent yeah, and everything. Yeah, novelty. You know, it was a shock at the time because my granddad lived with us. He was he died when he was eighty in nineteen seventy eight, mm -hmm. and leaving Dublin, in the sort of cocoon of Dublin, to go down to the country. Like we went from a two bedroom, you know, small little terrace house, mm -hmm. uh, to a four bedroom bungalow with a field. <laughs> and it was like, what's what's going on here? I thought you were after getting posh all of a sudden. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I tell you, I started started pronouncing my fours a bit different. Yeah. But no, it was good. I, like I went down to Mullingar. I said, you know, the big thing is. Sport really helps you integrate. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to school uh, straight away out playing football, um, joined the rugby club when I was 12, played Gaelic football for Shamrocks and for the school. And once you play sport like that, uh, within a year, I was in a county final under 12. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you're integrated. Yeah, yeah particularly uh, yeah. when it's, I think it's a very Irish thing, the GAA, like it is just a community in yeah. itself. Yeah. So as soon as you get involved, you will make friends. Absolutely. Like, no, and I think absolutely. the more rural you are as well, yeah. and it's, it's certainly the epicenter of, you know, most communities on yeah. it. Definitely. If you don't play, the, what's wrong with that lad? Why yeah. is he playing? You know, well, there must be some, something a bit queer about that yeah. lad now. Well, it was funny, like at the time, it goes to show you way, you know, society has changed. At the time, there was, I remember, there was one English guy, there was a dub, and there was a black lad. <laughs> and like, we were the three novelty factors. Like, we could have set up a, b a boy band or something. It would have been classic. But it was purely, like, that's the way Mullingar was. Now, you know, you walk from one end of the town to the other back in the day, you'd know everyone. It's great. Mm -hmm. I love that part. I love that part yeah. of the country. It's not like that now. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's really mushroomed. But, uh, no, great memories. Went down. Um, and never looked back, left it, probably sad to leave it. Okay. As I always say to my wife, my wife's a dub, if I'd married another, a woman from the country, I would have lived in Mullingar gladly. <laughs> gladly, because it's a, it's a great town, you know, it really is. We've had, uh, Shamrocks hasn't been brought up, uh, it's been brought up before on the podcast, should I say. We had um, Connor Moore. Do you know yeah, 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 yeah. We had him in uh, talking about the the upcoming final that was at the time. He was the Lowman's uh, end of Mullingar. Yeah. No, no, he, 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 he Shamrocks. Shamrocks. Sorry, they, they beat, yeah. they beat, um, they beat um, Lowman's in the Lomans. final this yeah. year. I was at the game. But it was funny, I was in school with Connor's uncles. Oh, let's yeah. see if I can remember. Ned. 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 Yeah. Ned yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And John. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gary's yeah. the brother, wasn't it? Gary's the brother. Back on it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that was a good final. It was funny because Kevin Daly would have played rugby with me in Mullingar and Killian played wing back for Shamrocks this year mm. and Killian was here with us with Freshers when I called ah. Freshers with Ross. So I know I'm getting old when I'm meeting sons, sons. Of, of, <laughs> of lads I played it's sport like, with. Like, like you've heard of the six degrees of separation that you're no, you're no yeah. further than uh, six oh, connections yeah, yeah. away. In Ireland it must be like two. I'd say so. Honestly. Oh, I'd say so. I'd have pushed three. But yeah. I, yeah. I guarantee if you walk into a pub in Ireland you'll struggle. If, if you attempt it properly, not to find someone in common with just a random or yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, I think that's the nice thing about being Irish. I think it's it certainly uh, it connects us, doesn't it? It really Definitely. does. Yeah, yeah. So, Ken, when you were young, you were playing a lot of sport. Was mm. a career in sport ever in your mind, or what was what the young yeah. Ken Robinson want to do? Well, I think the biggest thing, uh, Gavin, that happened to me in school was uh, I was decent enough in school, and in third year we did some sort of psychometric testing, and you were given your IQ score, and I found out. I was the second highest in third year. Now that was the worst news ever to give me because I just thought, okay, sit back, 
hands back, <laughs> smoked the, the cigar and, and rocked through this leave and start gig. That didn't happen. I got a good kick in the ass from myself. So, um, and it's funny, Paddy Doherty, and Paddy's from uh, Westmead. Paddy is in charge of all games development referees in Crow Park. And I lectured Paddy in UCD this year. Paddy got highest. And I, I would always slag him this year. I said, Paddy, you got the highest. He didn't even remember. I'd remember those little details. Um, I didn't work hard enough for leaving, sir. My daughter's doing leave and search. She just got 400 points in the mocks. And I was saying, that's great. 400's great because you're not ready yet for mocks. I didn't work hard enough for leave and search. And we were having dinner on Paddy's night. She said, what's the one thing you'd change if you were going back in time? Now, I've been very lucky in my life. I'm 52 years of age. I'm very lucky. I, I've got a really good life and I've worked hard. It's gone well. But I would have worked harder in leave and search. To have that, what you have. I never had that college experience. I, I, I did my... Cert, cert, diploma, degree, masters, second masters, all at night time. I'm going to London on Friday week, I uh, digress slightly to St Mary's in Twickenham, where I've just done my masters in strength and conditioning over four years. Now that was to consolidate my two certs back in 92, 93, that really were my trade and my apprenticeship, but missing that college experience, because I would have loved it. I really would have loved it. Whether it was down to Athlone RTC at the time, which is now Athlone IT, just to get it. But I think really, looking back, and I say this to anybody of your age, maximise your talent. Don't leave it behind you, because there's nothing worse than thinking, ah, it'd be grand. Now, I was an only child, so therefore I didn't have anybody sort of, you know, cutting the long grass for me going through. So looking back at it now, my experience to my daughter, my son, would be different to what I got. But anyway, did I want a career? Yeah, I wanted to be a PE teacher. That's what I really want to do. Or a sports journalist. Oh. Yeah, would have loved to be a sports well, journalist. Well, I can bring it back there just yeah. slightly to what you said. I, in that interview that we spoke with, that I went with, I, I had somebody look over my CV and we had a bit of a disagreement. I did two years of a three-year degree in NUIG and I, I dropped out. Um, I didn't complete the degree and I came to DCU two years later um, to where I am now. I was told not to put that on my CV because it doesn't look good that I didn't complete the degree. It, it doesn't show commitment and hard work and different things like that. But I, I distinctively disagreed with him because I firmly believe it shaped yeah. me and where I am today. Yeah. And I, for that reason alone, and I did include, and I was asked in the interview, um, you know, why did you leave? And mm. I told him, you know, um, I didn't enjoy it. But he said, you know, a lot of people won't put that on. Absolutely. I think you're spot on. If you look at the Americans, the Americans say to be a success, you've got to fail. And I think we have this cocoon in Ireland of you know you go to school you leave school at 18 you go to college 22 you come out you work you get married by 25 and then you relax the rest of your life and life is wonderful it doesn't work that way and, and I honestly believe what you're saying there how many times I enrolled on a master's in sports psychology in Waterford back in 06 and I lasted two weeks because I realized I mean mm, it is Waterford in fairness <laughs> yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to hold any coaches against you there <laughs> but it was more the fact that why am, what am I doing this for? I'm chasing a hobby. And I left it for a year and I did my MBA in the business school here. And that's where, I, even though my, my primary degree was in business management, mm. I wanted to do the MBA and I was like a duck to water. But I think when you're younger, like at that stage I was 40, but when you're younger, it's a hard decision sometimes to go, hang hand up, whoa, I think it's brave. I think it's brave, I think it's courageous, I think it's reflective, and I think it's insightful to go, no, no, that's not the course for me. I'll go this way. So I, I think, you know, you do what your gut says. So yeah, I wanted to do that and didn't get enough points. And I knew that wouldn't happen. It wasn't like back in the day, you know, you didn't have PLC courses, you didn't have certificate routes. I mean, I look at one of the best programs. I'm going to TUD tomorrow. I'm reviewing a lot of their programs as a, an external uh, assessor. And I would look at the leisure management program in, D, in DIT, which is now TUD. If I were me then, now, I would do that, it's a great course. There wasn't that option at the time. So I worked, um, I started in the gym because when I was playing rugby in Mullingar up to 18, 19, I was 15 stone, so I was a, a blocky prop. And I was fit enough, but all of a sudden I came out of leave and cert and one of the things I did was join a gym. And when I started training in the gym, all of a sudden this road to Damascus moment came along where I lost three and a half stone, I'm down to 11 and a half stone. And it was like, I'd walk down Mullingar and people wouldn't even know. You know how are you, how are you, John? Well, no, they wouldn't know. So there was this sort of new uh, development. And being in the gym, I realised, good God, after all this time, that's after getting me into shape. Brilliant. Loved it. 
gym job came up in the paper and I went for it and I remember my mum um, saying to me there's a job there it'll be suit you and I thought oh, no and we had a row over and I said no it wouldn't suit me they'd want somebody big and muscular and you know blah 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 weightlifter but I went in got the job and that was 85 and 85 to 89 I worked under a world powerlifting champion okay. uh, silver medalist under 23 great guy Tom Ward and Tom, in those days, was on the job training. So he trained me in programming, exercise, uh, prescription, blah, blah, blah. And I, I worked. So in 89, I then managed the gym. My dad died in 88. I was 21. And God rest him. And I, I then decided, right, I had the opportunity then to manage the gym. So I managed the gym from 89 to 93. And around 92, I realized, this is great, but I need to qualify. I need to get some paper here because this is now six years since I've left school. Sorry, 92, nine years since I've left school. No papers. And uh, at that time, yeah. like, as much as, probably not to the extent that it is today that a piece of, sorry, the piece of paper, the mm. degree, the diploma, whatever it may be, is it's a requirement. Yeah. Back then, would it have been a requirement or was it a bonus? Do you know what it was, Greg? It was something where I thought, I, maybe, I'm not trying to claim, oh, I was this visionary, I could see it but I was protecting myself. Okay. I could see that there was more and more courses coming along and it was all right to have the experience, but I, I also was building myself up for the exit interview. And I knew if I sat across a table that on the job experience was one thing. So I ended up going to Brendan Hackett in Motions and League Slip, who ran the National Certificate in Exercise and Fitness from Limerick for an academic year, September to May. Brilliant, I only spoke to him recently. He still retains the integrity of it. Some course will offer them in 12 weeks, become a fitness instructor in six weekends, which is horseshit really. You know, you need to have that. And I did that, and then I did level two. Um, my mother gave me 850 pounds at the time to pay for that course. She said, no, I want to pay for it, there you go. I paid her back subsequently, I think. But uh, anyway, I did the course, and then in 93, I moved from city gyms to Kiltiernan Sports Hotel, which is gone now, but that was where the ski slope was, etc. And I went in there as fitness manager, and they paid for my level two. And the funny thing was, I was still carrying anatomy and physiology from those courses in my master's in strength and conditioning, which was amazing. It was really a very good course. So I was 93, and then in 93, I went to Kiltiernan, stayed there for three years, built it from 600 members to three and a half thousand members, wow. which was great. And at the same time, started training teams. I trained my first team, Leitrim, Dublin-based lads, in 89. And then I trained Wicklow under-21s around 94. And in 95, I started with Glenan Hockey. And Glenan Hockey was through a friend of mine said, listen, we need an outside physical trainer. We have a very talented crew. Subsequently, Graham Shaw, who was the Irish uh, senior manager. Sharpie was with us then. He was only a kid. And... He had no caps, he ended up with 154 caps. And I was physical trainer with them for 10 years. Wow. And it was like, I had no background in hockey, but I could train people, I could gel people, and I enjoyed it. And we won Leinsters and All-Irons, etc. And then in 95, just on the career, I then, 96, sorry, I went to general manage ESB Sports Co. And that's where I moved. I was offered RTE to do the fitness slot. Or I was offered, and I was offered a high level multi-millionaire Irish person as PT but I decided to go the business route and um, thought there would be more future in that. Just safe. And uh, so that brought me to 96. So okay. I'll stop there for, so you can throw a question. <laughs> but that brings us to 96. So Gavin, it answers your question yeah. in a long way, but that was the that was the 13 year journey to 96. Well, my first question to that is, how did you go from 600 to three and a half thousand? What was your recipe there? The USP we had, Greg, was this. Kiltiernan was a lovely setting, and it was right in the Enniscorty, Enniscary, uh, Bray border, um, and Westwood was out there as well in Leopardstown Racecourse, and they were forty pounds a month. And we went in at thirty pounds a month, and a little bit like the gym here, got great staff. I had three staff when I started. I ended up at twenty six. We had That's great, so yeah, we had great classes, and a really good atmosphere, and a little bit like here as well. Any gym I've ever managed has always had that success factor of being clean and welcoming, having great staff and great classes. Because a dumbbell's a dumbbell, treadmill's a treadmill. But if you've got great classes, and we had all the people from Greystones, we had the people coming from Enniscary, Bray, and then we made a mistake. And it, you learn this in business. Westwood 
extended her pool, made a bigger pool, and we went to 40 quid a month. So you had this, boom, mm. and all of a sudden it went down. So in 96 then, I left and went to ESP Sports Co as general manager, I was recruited. I've applied for one job in my life, one job, and that was 1985. I haven't applied for a job since. That was the man to be manager of? That was to go in as a PT and, and the gym okay. instructor. And then 89, the same, we had two branches, one in Donnybrook, one in town, I became manager of that. 93, Kiltiernan asked me to, no, sorry, I tell a lie, Kiltiernan I applied for. Okay. And after that then, ESB came for me for 96, I stayed as GM there for 2004, and it was a very interesting story, and I, I like to share this, because at this stage of my life, I like to be honest with stuff. Uh, well, always honest, but openly honest. Um, my wife said to me, I got engaged to my wife in 93, and she said to me, even though she loved me, of course, she said, you're weak on paper. <laughs> and I went, what? And at that stage, like I'm 26 years of age with an ego running out the door, thinking, weak on paper, me? <laughs> and I was. She was dead, right? It's, it's, it's a manly thing. Yeah, yeah. of course it's it is. Yeah, me. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, yeah. It was like, to question my manhood almost. <laughs> yeah, weak on paper. But I was. And the problem was, she said, you've got good experience, you've a couple of certs, but she says, when you start going for jobs to be really making a dif difference, they're going to say you're weak on paper. Well, anyway, talking about Groundhog Day, I'm sitting in the ESB head office, up on the top floor, being interviewed by five people from HR and management, blah, 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 going for the general manager job. And apparently 100 had gone for it. They interviewed 10. And the guy says, you're weak on paper. I thought my <laughs> wife had just entered the room. <laughs> so I said, yeah. I said, it's a fair point. I said, I don't have a degree. But I said, I'll tell you what I have. I have 11 years experience. And if you pay for my degree, I'll have it in three years. So anyway, subsequent, got the job. And they sent me for my degree. So I did, and it's funny when you look at education, and you guys are in the thick of it, and it's wonderful. As a friend of mine says, there's two things most important in life, oxygen and education. And when I went for the interview, or the, the interview and they paid for my degree, I was scared to do a degree. Because I thought at this stage, my academic confidence was in my boots. Because, you know, don't forget, I had probably got the equivalent of 290 points in my leaving cert, if you put it back. And even though I had rocked out a good junior cert, but it didn't work hard enough. So what happened? They ended up, I did a diploma. And I did a two-year diploma in business studies. And because I got a 2-1, I was able to go into year three of the degree. So I ended up in three years getting two pieces of paper, a diploma and a degree. Very good. And that was great. So that then, that was 2001. Our Michael was born in 98. So that was 98 I started, 2001 I finished. And that was like, I always describe education as, that was the jigsaw puzzle that then started putting the pieces in the right way to crystallize a picture. But it was a, a, it was a monkey off my back because all of a sudden by 2001, having left school 16 years earlier, I now have my degree. And it was probably something, Colin, that I wanted to have probably in 1921. Uh, in, in mm -hmm. And eventually I had it. So that was me. I was in Sportsco then for eight years as general manager. We had 11,000 members there, big facility. I left it with a 12 million. My legacy there was I left it with a 12 million development plan, which came to fruition four while I was there, eight more afterwards. Uh, national quality finalists, good team. My operation manager became the, the GM, and I got my degree, and it was profitable. You know, We turned over about, at the time, two million a year, making about 350,000 profit. And then in 2000, I started lecturing 19 years ago this month in UCD. UCD, UCD came along and asked would I start lecturing on the diploma program, and I did. And I enjoyed that, and I do strategy and operations in sport. And that was really funny, Gavin, because that was bringing me right around to Jeepers. Here's this, as a friend of mine, Mick Bone always says, you're like a third level PE teacher, because you know all of a sudden here I am, lecturing and I wanted to be a teacher and I'm coaching and I wanted to be a PE teacher. So it was quite poignant that the it went The course is sports ma management, is it? The course is sport. I, I lecture out there on sports management right. on the degree now, diploma's gone, and the masters. Okay. So I've had a lot of the rugby boys come through and I've had under a grad rugby guys as well. Do you do any lectures for first years by any chance? I don't. Okay. Funny enough, I start in second year, right. third year, and then I do master. Yeah. So if you I, know someone in first, I do, I they, do. they might have me in second um, year. My mate Aaron, he oh, yeah, Burns, he moved yeah. down. Yeah, he did his leaving cert. He got 400 points um, 
and the degree was in UCD, uh, and you know, CAO came out, it was like 401, missed out, and second round offers, missed out again, uh, so he went to Blanche last year, Great. and uh, he did a similar course, and then uh, you know, he reapplied for this year, and like round eight oh offers, God. like end of September, wow. gets it. I didn't wow. even know there was that many rounds yeah, in the yeah, yeah. yeah, that's incredible. It's a high demand program that, mm. and and like all, like a lot of programs, like I always think there should be a portfolio along with your points because you know people do it for the wrong reasons. Like the first thing you're doing communications, why you have an end goal. Somebody does sports management, what's the job? Mm. You know they really have to be a bit more aware. But yeah, so I'm lecturing there 19 years, and then in 2004 DCU come in. I was an external interviewer here. And they'd opened the new sports complex, the pool, etc. And the job was advertised. And I didn't go for a first time round. And then they came back again in the October. And I went, I'm here since November 1, 04. While I've been here, as part of my package, they've paid for two masters. So I did my MBA across the way, in the business school, which was brilliant for two years. Did that 07, I'm, I'm 10 years graduated in that. And then four years ago in 14, five years ago, I was in Australia for a month oh. and sport in Australia is huge and you just and I was getting a little bit of a, an inkling I'd done my UKSCA which is the United Kingdom Strength and Conditioning Association certs and that was grand but something was itching me and I'd be pretty determined and stuff and I said you know what again a little bit like you asked me why the cert back in the day I was now seeing I was coaching when I finished with Ganan I went back to my own club and coached Luke and Sarsfields uh, the senior team and in 2011, November, I went to Ballymun Kickhams. And I went to an All-Ireland final with them, coached them with Paul Curran as manager for three years. But around that time, I was thinking, you know what, there's a lot of young guys and girls coming through with sports science degrees, and they're coming out with a lot of different qualifications, and I need to do something. And a colleague of mine who was working here, Martina McCarthy, said, listen, look at this, what I'm doing. St. Mary's Twickenham, which is a pedigree, a high pedigree university, and it was something that was a two, three or four years online. It went over three times a year and I, enrolled, I, I applied while in Australia. They accepted me and that was tough. That was, I mean, the, the level of science in it, the level of coaching was fine, but the science, the physics, the, the biology, the, the physiology, it was bringing me to a level that I, I was academically capable of but I had to challenge myself like, yeah. if I read a business paper I'll read a business uh, Harvard review paper in 20 minutes I'll speed read it I'll get it scientific papers I had to read it like I was learning to read English again okay. and so that took it to me but I was determined to do it I ended up getting a 2-1 in it and um, which I was delighted with I seem to be 2-1 all my life because I've had 2-1 on my masters my masters my degree my diplomas my, I, I only got a pass on my first cert because I forgot my cards for <laughs> cert training I was sick of that but the point is you know am I academic mm, I don't know I'm more a pracademic you know I like to mix the two okay. mix the two well for someone that has you've got quite a list of qualifications yeah, now, yeah, at this point yeah. for you to say that yeah. but like uh, to pick up on what you said there I think it's about at the half hour mark, so we'll reset that okay. just to get ahead of it. Sorry, it does half an hour. Yeah, blocks. no problem. Am I right? Ten Future producer. Oh, look. Director. He called it literally one day. He was literally, I, I was about to open my mouth and he just goes, and then you can, you can hear the shutter go on the camera. Class. Um, Devil's in the detail. <laughs> Clairvoyant. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah, all good. Hi. So just to bring it back to what you said there, like obviously, so you, you've been on panels for interview, you know, interview panels as such and, mm. and, and different things. Someone comes to you with 10 years experience, but they don't have a degree to their name. Mm. But you get a guy who has a year's experience, but he has four degrees, mm. you know, four qualifications mm. to his name. What do you think? I always work off the All Blacks principle, person before player. You know, you look at the legacy book, James Kerr's book, and they say, you know, look at the person. Because if you see an honesty in a person and you see a capability in a person and a potential and a drive, that comes to fruition when you're at the hardest part of a game. Somebody is, you know, cutting corners and training, missing training, excuse and training. When the SH1T hits the fan in a big match, they go missing. So I suppose... You try to use your gut, and I love to give, I'm not being ageist, I love to give younger people opportunities. Okay. Now, the one thing I'm coming up against now is I'm getting people suffering from anxiety, 
and you know you, you have this plan you think listen we could do this and all of a sudden you're overwhelmed them so i've got to be aware of that that my vision of this listen this could be a great plan for you we took a girl on placement from dit recently and she lasted three weeks okay. she wasn't able mm. but to really answer your question i would go on the person their potential and their likability okay i really think their likability factor because nobody wants to work with a dickhead and if they're a dickhead they better the best dickhead in the world because when you work as a team, you want to enjoy working. Mm -hmm. You really do. And so I would look at the potential okay. and I would look at their work ethic. You know, what have they done? And the one thing I will say, people who have studied at night time do have that work ethic of, you know, we've got to juggle everything in here. Okay. But somebody goes straight to college could also be very good. But, you know, what else have they done outside? What, what has formed their character no matter what age? Yeah, I like that answer. Yeah. Um, this is probably going to sound like a silly question given you've been in the sports field for so long but have you ever throughout your career lost the grow for sport as like as it's in its most pure form as like your hobby what you mm. you've it enjoyed doing as a kid? To, has yeah. it ever felt yeah has it ever felt like a chore yeah like my escapism because I go over to Old Trafford probably no matter who you follow yourself and Ross probably quite Ross, often Ross and myself go about six times a year yeah. I go about 18 times a year wow. and that's my escape yeah. that's what I absolutely I, I would do that rather than play golf I, I, that's, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life I love going over um, sport the one thing I'd say Colm, as, a, as a coach you're a battery and when your energy is dissipating and coming down you have to do something to go and plug it in because if you go like I'm with Dublin ladies tonight before I go, I'll have coffee, I'll play my favourite music, I'll be on point when I arrive. Because it's not just when you go on field, it's greeting, it's the smile, yeah. it's, you know. Setting the tone. Setting the tone. Setting the tone. That is mission critical because you don't realise how much you set the tone. Mm -hmm. Your parents coming into the house set the tone. You coming into the house sets the tone. The teacher in this classroom sets the tone. So setting the tone is critical. So I try to refresh. I do have a mantra, three years max for the team even though I stayed 10 years with Glenan, but that was probably not as intensive. Uh, Glenan, uh, Lucan was two years, Ballymun was three, Dublin Hurlers was two, then Dublin Ladies is three with a possible fourth. So that's the span because I think you owe that team, like Alex Ferguson would be an idol of mine, but he reinvented himself nearly every three, four years with a new number two. Reinventing yourself to be ready is critical. So have I lost the grow along the way? Yeah, it's a great question because I work in sport, I lecture in sports management, um, but I bring the business principles in and I like that side of it. I like using my MBA as much as my MSc and uh, having that mix of it, like, you know, I'll be meeting the accountants here, the finance director, COO, so you do have that business side of it. So I think if I was a pure PE teacher, going back to the, the 83 aspiration, it might become a little bit like a Groundhog Day tracksuit time. Yeah. Like tomorrow I'm reviewing the program with TUD, that'll be a suit and tie job and it'll be coming from that perspective of being analytical. So I have variety, I learned a great term this year I didn't re hear before, I'm a blended professional. And I heard that down in Pats, um, you know, if you have a few roles, so I lecture, I run a business that's probably, you know, 2.7 million a year for that student experience, I, I coach, and I do some consultancy. So when I put all that together, there's a little bit of blended professionalism, yeah. you know. So that, and, that, and keeps when, me, when that keeps the butterfly satisfied. Uh, and when do you see your family in between all oh, of this? Like? All the time. My, my daughter said to me yesterday, Daddy, are you home already? I said, it's 20 to seven. She says, you only left earlier in the day. But um, no, I do. I have a great relationship with my son, my daughter. Um, I play golf with my son. I don't go to the gym with him anymore because he's too fit for me. <laughs> um, I go to matches with both of them. He's come to the Barcelona game with me. She's coming to the thing to Chelsea game. So there's a good blend there. Okay. So and you know what's it's funny, maybe I'm getting old, it's a sign of it, Greg. But my my highlight of my week now, sad as it is, is my hour and a half walk with my wife every Saturday morning and we breakfast afterwards. So I'm enjoying walking now. Now I'll run twice a week, I'll gym twice a week. But that walk is like gold us to have that time together. Okay. So, so yeah, so oh, I do. It's, it's just the chat of going along, the it's leisurely the chat. stroll. It's the, the well, come here, it's, <laughs> she won't say it's leisurely because we're, we're going to walk Crow Patrick in August. Oh, um, so, you know, like, I'm a bit competitive. So every time we do it, it's not like, you know, full metal jacket walk, you know. Okay. Um, although I did say something to her last Saturday. She said, this weather is bad. And I said, look, I had to go home and 
vegetarian. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. She didn't like that. She didn't know, she, she'd get on with it, but it was great. Like, the same woman will lash out 64 laps in the pool here. Um, but that time together, and I think as I get older, I value my health, I value my time with my family, I value planning. I got a letter in last week from DCU telling me I'm retiring in 12 years' time, and I thought it was some old guy. Was that the ever thinking, who's that pretty old guy? You know, what's that all about? You know, me? I'm still 20. So, you know, you, you do plan as you get older. Maslow comes in, doesn't he? That hierarchy of needs. You know, that's why today is a pleasure. Today is not a chore. Today is to give you guys something that you're craft and your 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 skill and your your art and what you're doing brilliant to be on that journey so anything you can do for people you try and help mm -hmm. ken as a coach you know for the players it's you, their job to learn from you but what have you learned from being with players and coaching them what have they passed on to you from just experience over the years uh, yeah do you know something gavin I, the biggest thing i've learned is what we said earlier on setting the tone like, you don't walk in with a big, I have an MSc on your chest, and you know, I'm the man. And I've probably learned from female teams, like, in the age of equality, they're different. <laughs> and that's as true as God, because I'd have the gym music for the, the, the hurling team, a different gym music for the girls. Mm -hmm. I get them to give me their favorite song, I put it on Spotify, and, and we're talking ABBA, we're talking like Maniac, we're talking stuff that's like, whoa, really? Okay, that's great. <laughs> Sounds play, a bit like Shite Night. <laughs> <laughs> but if I played that with the lads, I mean, the lads would be more heavy rap and it's all lyrics that would like, you wouldn't be playing to the, to the priest. But the big thing about it is, I've learned, I remember reading a Harvard article a while ago, Gavin, and it said, when you come to a senior position in work, 80% of your time is spent on the soft skills. And that's critical. I was doing MBA interviews last week with students, uh, postgrad students, and that likability, that connection with people, that smile. I ran on the pitch, I, I do the running on the pitch, and the 2017 All Ireland final playing Mayo, and I ran on, Nick, the earphone came in, boom, on I went. And I went up to Rachel Ruddy, one of our players, she's a pro, she's a great player, and I smiled and I said, listen, it's going great, let's move the ball quicker to get it out of the fence and move it well. The feedback afterwards was, when Ken came on the pitch, he smiled. It calmed us. Now, that was in front of 37,000 people. Now, I'd been in Croker several times with the hurlers, only once with Ballymun. I didn't have that calmness in the Ballymun game because it was the first time. And you learn, learn from your experiences. Every day is a learning day. Every day is about meeting nice people, learning from you guys. You learn from me, I'm learning from you. Sharing experiences. And I think your story, Greg, about two years NUIG and deciding abort, go there, brilliant, because none of us are perfect. So along the way, reflection, a lot, like I'm reading The Chimp Paradox at the moment, Steve Peters, all about your inner chimp. I have that book. Yeah, yeah. you'll have it after three chapters, by the yeah. way, but it's still a great book. But it's just reflection on, okay, how do I, I would be impulsive, I would be, I would have had fiery temper when I was younger, but sometimes somebody might be annoying you, but. As Covey used to say, in order to be understood, seek first to understand. You know, just, what, what's, what's Gavin's point of view? Okay, listen to him, what's he saying that for? Okay, as opposed to, no, that doesn't work. So I've learned my soft skills. And I would have thought coming along the way, I'm great with people, I know names, I'm great with people, and I, I can communicate and all that. Communicating sometimes is listening. Communicating is understanding, the smile. And the other thing a pal of mine says, when you're a follically challenged coach, you need to smile more. <laughs> Because a bald head can be severe, so you've got to smile. And that's the thing. When the girls see it, I get texts all the time. The captain say, great session tonight. You set the tone. Now the key is, you've got to learn that every time. Mm. So if I go over there tonight and I'm feeling, ah, bit, you know, the weather's all right. No. On point, ready. And the same with the customers inside. I was teaching this morning. And my oldest member of my class, 83, the first thing I think about when I go to that class is, what do my members, who are ranging probably from 50 to 83, what do they want? They want mobility, they want stability, so balance, and they want a decent heart and lung workout. Now, you get that for them, they're leaving. I'm getting a lot of people saying to me, the class is brilliant, I'm feeling I'm doing this, I'm getting better at that. So it doesn't matter whether they're an athlete, a kid, five years of age, whatever. You've got, my son's a swim teacher, and he's the same. He gets swim teaching to kids to get their confidence up. So think of every situation as being in the water. How do you get the confidence up and the self-esteem? So that's what I would say. That's what I've learned. Well, 
like, okay, it's going to seem like an obvious question, but like, there has to be days when you're just, you can't get yourself to that, you know, set the tone level that, like, you know, you say your coffee, you listen to your bit of music, you, you get yourself in the zone. Like, it, it can't work all the time. Can no, it? no. I, I mean, my wife would say, yeah, that, somebody would say to her, God, Ken has great energy and he's so, you know, she says, yeah, well, okay. Ken at home might not always be like that. So, <laughs> so it's good. No, I think the thing about it is, Greg, I think you've got to, no, you, you'd be a hyper bunny if you're running around smiling, high five and all the time. You've got to have your, your time. Okay. Like, I love me time. It might be, go I don't play as much golf as I used to, but I go to the driving range, 20 minutes, half an hour, have a coffee, hit a few balls, enjoy. Um, I, I'm a bit of a sort of an OCD clean freak as well. When if I, if I hoover the house or I have, everything's in order, that gives me an inner calmness. My kids laugh at that. They really do. Uh, when I say kids, 21 and 18, but they're young adults, but they laugh at me like that. You know, dad's off on one, but I, I like to get things in order, you know, and if, but also, if I've got my workout done, if I get, like today I worked out in the gym, yesterday I ran, gym the day before, rest tomorrow, gym Friday, walks on Saturday. Uh, so when I get those things done, and I'm eating well, I'm sleeping well, I find as I get older, I go to bed a little bit earlier. But I like to get up at half six, seven, have my first cup of tea. Um, Covey said it in Principal Centre Leadership, he said, you know, if you're happy with yourself, you'll be happy with others. But getting that quiet time, you know, to just, the drive home, um, watching something on TV that you really like. Um, but I think reflecting as well and realizing a great term I heard a phrase was, today is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday and it didn't happen. Okay. So sometimes, and, and I see my daughter who I, I, I absolutely adore, and my son, I adore him as well. But my daughter is a terrible worrier. Like she was playing a match today and she was worried about our mock leaving cert results. And I'm saying, listen, don't even worry about the mock leaving cert. That's only a test of endurance. You'll know where it's happening. So she's rattled out 400. They are in the Leinster semi final. And today she's great. This morning she was like, this, you know, about to implode. As you get older, you realize it'll happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll make it happen. You can't be, you know, a mattress Mick lying back on the, on the mattress thinking this leaving cert will happen because I have the second highest IQ in St. Mary's <laughs> and Mullingar. Bring it on. Hard work beats talent every day when talent doesn't work hard, to use that phrase. Um, so look, I think it's a balance. I think your health, as you get older, um, you know, you guys can go out and do three or four nights in a row. At my age, we went to a wedding later last week. Friday wedding, went to bed at two, got up the next day at 12, jaded. And that night, there was the second part of the wedding, and it's like, okay, here we go again. So you do value your quiet time, your health, but you also value meeting nice people. Okay. You know, you really do. And that can be from you guys to the older adults inside to the players tonight. You know, having Patrick's Day is a day I love. My favourite pub in Dublin is a cabin pub, oh. the Boar's Head. Oh, and yeah. Hugh Hurrigan owns the Boar's Head and it is just the best pub in the world as far as I'm concerned. And I went into there on, on Sunday, Patrick's Day, had some breakfast, had two pints of Guinness, went to the club finals with my wife. And that was lovely. And like it's those simple things that are just, but you're meeting friends at the final and you're having another pint and you're just enjoying it. Look, that's what gets you through. But you do need that downtime because if you're with the team all the time, like we're going to Galway Sunday, two o'clock throw in, that'll be an 8.30, 9.30 meet back at eight that night. Okay. But the one thing you've got to do is you've got to go with that positive frame of mind that, you know, it's like if you've been to Australia or America, particularly Australia, people say, oh, it's a long flight. No, it's an adventure. You go with it, it's an adventure. Dress accordingly, bring your books, iPad, whatever it might be, look forward to the food on the plane, then it's a journey. But if you think, oh, you know, because people can be half full in Ireland, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, you give someone a compliment, it's like, ah, yeah, but, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing well in college, ah, yeah, but, no, no, you're doing well in college, thank you. The Americans are great, thank you, sir, I appreciate that, I'm working hard. I think it comes a lot more naturally to Americans, yeah. you know, to compliment. And yeah, we both are. We're, we're very like, yeah, yeah. If, it. if one of these gave me a compliment, I'd be like, okay, you're saying yeah. that. <laughs> you so what, what's wrong then? Like, that's exactly. right. Where, when's the bus come? Yeah, yeah when's the, the bus come? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. One question I want to approach you, Ken, because you've um, coached so many successful teams, um, historically or present, is there any teams that you would have loved to or would like to coach? And I'm not going to limit it to GAA yeah. or rugby or you can, if you Whatever can. Whatever code you yeah. use. Yeah, well, I mean, come here. 
I'd love my ashes scattered in Old Trafford because that's, that's, that's where I'm at. Since 1974, I follow them. And, uh, but no, I, in teams, realistically, uh, you know, I, I, I played uh, under Joe Schmidt in Mullingar. Joe Schmidt was great. And the, the, looking back on Joe, and that was 91, 92, Joe had a smile. Joe knew names. And Joe acknowledged people. And his training methods were great because they got you with the ball early on. It was brilliant. Um, Any time we go in camp, I remember being we won a European silver medal with, with Glenan in Gibraltar. You're there a week. When you do that type of pseudo professional gig where you're gone somewhere for a week, mm -hmm. so that then Colin, it's like, oh, this is like what it's like to be a pro. So there is that nice thing that when you go on camp, it's like you're there. So to be in the professional setting of sport would have been really nice to be with a Leinster or a Munster or whatever. Um, Dublin senior football, I won't get that because. Brian Cullen's in situ in the athletic development side of that. Um, so Dublin, Dublin Hurling was a great gig and I, I saw them win against Tip on Saturday uh, on the TV and I, they're just a brilliant bunch of fellas and Matty's at the helm now and it's great. I wish the Hurlers great success. They're a great bunch of fellas. Um, looking back on it, if you said to me now, right, you're going to work on a team, yeah, I'd love to work in Premiership Soccer with a team. That would be lovely. I was watching that even though I'm a United fan, I was watching All or Nothing on mm -hmm. Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. Great stuff with Pep. Or the Sunderland Until I Die, did you catch that one? I'm going to catch that next. Yeah. That's the yeah. next one I'm going to watch. But, I mean, you look at Pep, and I'm a United fan. I should hate City. Probably don't. I dislike them. But I couldn't dislike Pep. No. Yeah. God, he's just... I haven't, haven't watched that. What an energy and lovely way. But that professionalism, to work with that. A friend of mine breeds racehorses. And uh, when you look at that talent... Like, I've been with successful teams, Colin. Um, I bring something to it, but you can't put in what God has left out. And when there's talent there to be seen, that's where you maximise. That's where you maximise. And, and that's the one thing, you know, people say, can you make me faster? Probably not. But I can make you stronger, I can make you fitter, and I can help you repeat your optimum sprint more often. But can I make you faster? Probably not. It's genetic. So, you know, you can't put in what God has left out. Uh, Ken, so speaking of Man United, I actually want to ask, um, of course, Jose Mourinho was fired mm. back in December, and a lot of people are saying it's due to how he treated the players. The players mentally just weren't in tune with Jose's philosophy. Um, how do you look back on his yeah. reign? Well, I mean, I was there for his first game when we beat Southampton, um, back in his first when Zlatan came in. It was funny when he had Zlatan there, yeah. he had his point guard, mm. he had his go to man, he had his dressing room orchestrator there was no doubt about that Zlatan brought a huge amount to it um, I mean we enjoyed Jose early doors but I remember being at the Crystal Palace home game in November and I left it thinking oh no the football I've now seen it nil nil against Palace the best player in the pitch was Wilfred Zaha who'd been at United but I think Jose every time he interviewed he was looking for a fight he was yeah. looking for a row if you remember the bags of his eyes. Oh, and then he started getting stubbly and he started looking a bit dishevelled and he wasn't happy. Yeah. And I think that the key thing is if you're not happy, you get out, whether it's a relationship, college, whatever. Ollie's gone in and he's brought back that United culture, there's no doubt. But looking at it against Wolves on Saturday night, the apathy was, was mm -hmm. pronounceable. I think he's got a strip about four. To me, centre half beside Lindelof, he's got to recreate midfield with some creativity and he's got to give us wingers. We've no Sane. We've no Zaha, we've no Sterling, we've no Salah, the way they run. And wingers, I was watching Giggsy goal against Arsenal again the other day. Wingers run differently. They're zany, they run. They're, you know, they're not predictable. You know, Rashford's not a winger, Marshall's not a winger. And we need creativity. So I'd give Ollie the job, but I would certainly think he needs a war chest of probably four players. But it's good. Holly's at the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> Just going to bring it back since we're in the soccer sphere. Jim McGuinness um, has, I suppose, the way he's, he's forged his own way. Um, would you take anything from that? I think the biggest thing about it is, I've never met Jim personally, but what I see is persona. He appears to be a very good guy. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at a generic set of skills, I think in Ireland, we're big into putting people in box. Where are you from? What do you do? Where do you go? How do you do it? There you are. There's your box. Thank you. And don't move outside that box. You won't. I remember when I went to the hurlers, people were going, what do you know about hurling? I said, nothing. But I'll tell you what I got in two years. I was at the club finals the other day. I wanted to see Ballyhale and Thomas's first. Before I saw anything else, obviously it was the first match. 
but seeing that hurling is just a wonderful sport to watch and I never had the appreciation because when I went to Joey's in Fairview and you can say at the time there was no hurling okay. there was football only when I went to Mary's in Mullingar there was no hurling football only so I never had that grow for hurling to hold a slitter and a hurl from a young age but Jim McGuinness go back to the question appears to have those people skills that he can transcend into different sports and I think the key thing is and it goes back to there's a great business principle called the Peters principle and Peter states that people are promoted to the level of incompetence for prior achievement as opposed to future potential now what does he mean by that Steve Staunton Steve Staunton magnificent player Liverpool United uh, uh, Ireland not a great manager though so great players don't make great managers Roy Keane great player not great manager so it's a different set of skills so Jim McGuinness can bring a skill set and transcend Joe Schmidt could manage a premiership soccer team I've no doubt about that attention to detail great person great people skills great organisational capability bring in the technical coach that's an interesting question now actually now that you think of it what coaching, uh, let's say, senior GA teams would you be? Would you see comfortably managing a, a Premier League team? Well, Jim Gavin would. Yeah. Jim yeah. Gavin and a heartbeat. Ruthless coach. efficiency. Yeah, ruthless efficiency, and Jim's on out coaching drills. So it goes back to that thing column of management coach. Uh, I was asked to coach my club team this year as a senior team, and I would have loved to do it, but it wasn't the right time. I wouldn't coach. I'd go in as manager, and I'd bring in a football coach. Because I want what I would see there lacking was environment, uh, bringing the right people together, attracting the younger guys that I would have coached from four to sixteen, different skill set. So when you look at that, you know, um, here's the funny thing, and, and I don't want to be controversial. No disrespect to the man. Could Brian Cody do it now? I think the energy and bringing something to it. Derek McGrath spoke at the GA conference this year, and I I spoke at a, a side talk. He was a keynote his passion, his energy, he could do it. Because you look at the intelligence of GA people, the intelligence of GA people, you know, too many soccer people think, oh, I played so I'll manage. It's not a God-given right. Yeah. But the problem is there's a union there that if you haven't played, it might be more difficult. Because yeah. people will always say, Mourinho, Wenger, you know, what have they done? The boy that's at Chelsea, sorry at the moment. So they do look for that, what have you done, as the rightful passage and badge of honour. Mm. You know, it's um, kind of like punditry as well. Like, yeah. sure, how many pundits do you see? I, I suppose apart from you, probably the off the ball lads. You know, they're either former inter county players or inter county yeah. managers, and yeah. you know, and, and some of them are great. I mean, you look at the soccer boys. Lineker's done a great job, in my opinion. Rio is great on it. Michael Owen is not. Um, in my opinion, again, you, you look at look at off the ball. Look at Tommy Rooney, who we'll hear in in in, uh, in Freshers. Tommy's doing a great job. Eamon Dunhu, yeah, great fellas. You know, look, Mary Crow. You know, look look at that. Um, you know, and it annoys me when I watch Virgin One Media and I see Paddy Mulligan being rolled out because he played for Ireland a thousand years ago. There's some great people. Mara Trasset, Nick Alley is doing a great job. Like, like it's about the it's about the likability factor again. When I watch that TV and I see the person, are they analytical? Do I like them? And are they making it? Lineker self-deprecating? You said it earlier on. Yeah, Lineker is Lineker he, laughs he, he can himself. take a joke yeah. he's great and when you laugh at yourself the man that I met here when he came in here for our heart program back in the day was Bill O'Hurley uh -huh. and Bill was a gentleman and the sign of a gentleman he was here walking around and when he was leaving he hunted us out to say goodbye but he was great look at the way he managed Giles and Dumphy and Brady back we'll leave it there so we'll leave it there okie dokie right so yeah our actual uh, every year in DCU there's an annual soccer game between the College View and DCU FM and myself and Greg are head and deputy of sport um, not respectively Greg is head on deputy yeah. this year so it's our it's our job to lead DCU forth uh, but the uh, the tournament itself is actually called the Billow Cup after Mr. Ah, Billow Hurley himself. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, and he was a gentleman. He was oh gentle. yeah, I, I like when when we were ever talking about like people we'd like to interview. If he had only, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, he yeah, would have no, been. It was great. Real, like in real, similar regard, like we got to interview Michael Lester right. um, in September. Which, and you know, any boy that's grown up watching the Sunday game, like yeah, it's, he's iconic, it's a, isn't it? It's a dream. Like, yeah, of course. We got Ross. Thankfully, got us uh, Darren Maloney there uh, a couple of weeks ago. A, again, again great you know. Guy. Played golf with Dara and I've met Dara several times. Dara's a good, good guy. Super nice guy. Yeah, like. Super nice guy. And I think that's the thing, lads. You know, you, you don't have to be, like the All Blacks from their principles, no dickheads. And like when somebody walks in, you know, 
everybody's going to reflect and I thought it was a great term last week is it Thomas Tuchel the PSG manager yeah. he said it brilliantly they said how do you motivate you know the superstars he says you find the little boy in them I thought well that's class yeah. because the likes of Pogba grew up in France playing football he wants to play football we all see the grass and we see a football we want to kick it mm. still motivate him through that because he's not going to be motivated by more money because he's got so that's it so you know nice people don't get walked on because you know to make the decisions but fundamental respect fundamental appreciation to people and and help people along the way right one last reset and we'll move into the lighter side yeah i have, I have one last question before we get to the lighter side the lighter side i thought we were being lighter. <laughs> <laughs> we well, call it the light side yeah but. i mean it's a pretty conversational show yeah no general. it's great the style of it's great Right. Yeah. <laughs> Stay you. Right, work away. Um, Ken, have you watched back Blue Sisters? Yeah, I watched it a couple of times. Um, that that was funny because the boys that did that from Loose Horse, um, were fantastic. And you know the best compliment you can pay them was we'd be on the coach, we'd be addressing them, whatever, and you'd hardly see them. And then you'd be aware they were there if you were having a conversation coming back on the bus. I love the bus coming back if it's dark and it's you're deep briefing after a game, you're having chats, but they were there. Um I watched it, we watched it in McGowns the first time when it's when it premiered and it was good. And uh, the boys stitched me up because the first time when they brought me into the Hilton in Kilmainham, um, they said, So Ken, tell us about the journey. And I said, Well, the journey of championship started in Leash, you know, really and I remember that day vividly. It was a drizzly wet day. And when, since I was with Ballymun, you'd always, Semple Stadium, I remember standing on the goal and going, wow, this pitch is big. Because we'd always look at how big the pitch was because we played a wide, expansive game. I watched Wolves beat United in the night and Doherty and the other boy were on, as Giles would say, chalk on your boots because from the, from the, the lines. So that grew up to see what pitch was it, to see how it would suit us because we were a fast-running, dynamic team. So brought that into the girls. So the first thing I saw on leash was, 125 by 70, wow. First thing you think there is ambush. Wet day, small pitch, tight, confined, physical. You know, you watch a match from behind the goal, it was in Croker the other day, club finals. Watch it behind the goal and you can see width or you can see condensed. So I said that was the way it was, went through it. Then I said on to Nolan Park. And I love Nolan Park because it's a great sod and I threw in the measurements. So I go on, go on, go on, go on like that. And next day just plucked it like I was an anorak plucked it from there and plucked it from there and it was all these pitch dimensions coming out you know so it was done with a purpose of play because you do have to look at that because we'd be big on width and I see Guardiola's big on width angles and width and he has Sané and Sterling right out wide because why not use the dimensions you know if you bring it in you know if it's five a side football it's a small pitch the bigger the pitch the better players that are faster and moving the ball quicker Crow Park never, ever um, is anything but a true indication of that and the best teams perform best. You know, so Blue Sisters was good. But you know what it was, Craig? It was great acknowledgement for the girls. Pity it wasn't this year because it was 50,151 at the women's final. But there was 37 and I suppose there was a good ending that we won. But it was good to show it for women's football, ladies football, whatever you want to call them, because they're footballers and they train as hard and they, they put in the commitment, they eat, they prep, they live it. And to have that recognition was terrific. You know, so, yeah, I've, I've only watched it twice, though. That's, that's I've it. watched it more times than yeah, you, then, yeah, clearly. Yeah. I've watched it three or four yeah. times. It's, it's definitely one of my favourite GA-related documentaries the last yeah. two, couple yeah. of years. Um, and we, we've been talk we were talking with um, Sinead Finnegan about it yeah. um, there just in December before we broke up for college. And... Um, yeah, like the twenty twenty campaign and everything, like women's uh, sport, both, both codes, like mm. sport in general, mm. is going from strength to strength, and you can see noticeable differences year mm. on year. One of my students this year in third year in UCD was doing a, um, they were doing a presentation on camogie, and they come up with a few interesting things I thought was really good because camogie's struggling a little bit at the moment. Mm. They said it should be called hurling, Com bring it into hurling, and they were saying that they should have names on the jerseys, they should do something with the helmets. Um, because that is the one thing, like I was looking out for TJ Reid the other day and I looked at him by his build and his gait and how he runs. But to boost that sport, camogie and hurling, hurling survives because the sport is so good, but camogie does need that 
to be the recognition the, factor the, the personalities yeah. the personalities because yeah. that's exactly it you know you you watch the NFL I watch the Patriots I love watching the Patriots but you watch it for the Tom Brady is a big mm. attraction so even in ladies football like the obvious names roll up roll off your tongue like Cora Staunton like mm. these are the names that are like kind of push or dragging the sport forward yeah. and you kind of need those leaders if you will well I reckon we've got the best footballer in the country at the moment playing and that's Sinead Ahern and, and like that's not being boastful because you know you're not supposed to say these things as being Irish because if we got beaten this year well we had the best football she is magnificent her her footwork her ability to score her spatial awareness her sense her intelligence is just phenomenal really really is you know and so you've obviously worked with some fairly successful teams as well yeah. in, in the men's court I suppose yeah. how does that even how does she compare in oh look you know at the end of the day as I said to a player on the other day look like Cara Finn Barcelona Manchester City what's the similarity move the ball simple and quick simple and quick better, player in a better position and the goal the other day for Cara Finn just you know accentuated that it was like simple angles but with speed you know and players sometimes forget the higher the levels you go it's about doing the simple things quicker again and, that, and that's the when girls come into us in the panel they might have some levels of skill but it's how quick they move the ball not themselves you know because you get them sprinting they all sprint but it's moving the ball it's that quickness of the agility of the mind to move it quick so you know but no it's great to get those role models it really really is and it's not it's like today it's great to see women's rugby doing well in, in dcu they're playing limerick today and you know hopefully that'll go well and um, so no it, look it's great that females have the opportunity to play sport at a very good level without being patronized because i, I firmly believe in equality terms that you know don't give somebody the job because she's a woman give her the job because she's competent and good and able to do it you know so whether you're male or female you know you're not just rolling in the token female because that's disingenuous and patronizing so if you're talented you should have the opportunity well, that's exactly what joanne cantwell said to us Thank nearly you. word for word Thank yeah you. so there you go yeah on merit not sex exactly, exactly yeah um, right, a little, we'll, little we'll, bit we'll of light. start to wrap up a little bit. Um, so you were talking there about how when you're getting prepped for like a training session, or whatever you like to, uh, to you drink your coffee and you listen to your music. What's in that music connection? Oh, I tell you, Spotify is the best thing ever to come along in my life because even in the car now on the Apple CarPlay, it just comes out and tells me all. My di- it shows how collective my mix is. So my favorite band in the world are you two. And the blackout is a song that they started a gig with this year in 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 the three, and uh, that's really good, strong, heavy bass. And I like that. Um, I could listen to Ario Speedwagon. Have you heard of them? I mean, I'm going right back. Def Leppard, um, bit of Spandau Ballet throws in there. Be listen to a bit of Joe Dolan, but don't tell too many people. <laughs> um, so who else? I like, I like a bit of Sam Smith. Um, you know, I like a bit of uh, Pink is good. Roxette it's so mixed you know um, my best pal he's a musician and he he sees like i ask him what he thinks of you too he goes oh, you know they're all right you know i just think they're brilliant so it is quite mixed you know uh, bohemian rhapsody brought my love back queen saw them in 86 and slain you know and freddie mercury what a voice so it's really anything that's really uplifting there great band from down your way wexford away near waterford cry before dawn if you ever looked them up uh, they were absolutely class love Aslan you know so there's there's a load of them in there you know that's uh, the best way to be any yeah. music that your kids listen to that you you hate or you love well my, my, my daughter plays music that I think I'm going to jump off a cliff every time she plays because <laughs> it's quiet and slow and loving and romantic and my son even laughs at it but you know he listens to he goes to uh, saunas and places like that and festivals so he listens to quite an eclectic mix of rapping his friends are into techno he's in more into heavy rap but um, no, I enjoy it because I think being with the girls and there, you know, there, there is a lot of, you know, uh, stuff that comes through. Um, and then when you go, my cousins in England, their daughter listened to Ariana Grande the other day and Justin Bieber. That brings it down another level again of age that they're about 12. So, you know, but look, if it's good, it's good. I like watching The Voice. So, uh, you know, when I see, uh, I was at a match a few weeks ago in Palace and Ali Moores walked by. You know, they see them, oh, there's Ali Moores. Um, <laughs> So, you know, if it's good, it's good. I still listen to Tom Jones, like, brilliant singer. So, yeah, you know, some of the new stuff is great. It's, uh, so, yeah, if it sounds good, I'll listen to it. Definitely a diverse range there. Oh, listen, <laughs> hey, I tell you, it's, it's, uh, it's eclectic with a big E. Um, Ken, so, we've established that you like coffee, but what kind of coffee do you like? Oh, 
the best coffee story I can tell you, I always have a story. Arthur Lanigan O'Keefe, A-Lock, the rock star, who's world champion pentathlon. Uh, and I was in class one day and we were talking about unique selling points and we got down to coffee. And he said to me, he said, cost, and he goes, 3FE. And I went, sorry. And he looked at me like it was the end of his shoe and he said, you haven't heard of it? So I hadn't heard of it. Um, the best coffee I've drank in recent, I have an espresso machine, but I'm going off that. Okay. Um, there's a little cafe down in uh, Manor Street called Slice. Okay. They do their own coffee. And my wife bought me yesterday a coffee cup that has the grinder in it. So you oh, put the coffee yeah, in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. So a bit of slice, bear coffee, mm -hmm. which is quite good. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've gone off an espresso. I think it's just too quick. And How did the, the tree of fee fare? It was nice. Yeah, smooth. It was lovely. Um, funny enough, McDonald's do a lovely coffee. They do, too. yeah. They do a lovely and coffee. The, and a nice the affordable coffee The, well. the tree of fee I was telling you about was, if you remember, before we met Kieran McGuinness, uh, from the Della right. in um, two pubs. Yeah, yeah. They they do three of each. Yeah, it's nice. I, I think my my wife's cousin in London there, two weeks ago we were over. He bought himself a, a barista machine for a thousand sterling, <laughs> and his coffee gets delivered at eighty five quid a bag. And I'm thinking, okay, that much, much. Yeah, it's a bit excessive, but the coffee is smooth. Mm -hmm. And I think the McDonald's because I take my coffee black, okay. so when you take it black, there's no Starbucks froth coming off it. It's you taste it, so you know it really is. And speaking of music, Coronas, I can't go oh, without right, I love the Coronas. I've seen them three or four times live and they're great. Brilliant. Love, love Danny, he's good. He really is. But yeah, coffee. Um, although, I still think a nice cup of tea, Mrs Doyle, is actually great. It's more homely. I okay. think it's more comforting having a, co uh, yeah, a tea Coffee's at home. more of an on-the-go kind Correct. of beverage. Correct. Yeah. Correct. It's out there, give me a pep, whereas... Walking down a busy street. Yeah, yeah. Tea at home is, is quite nice. Yeah, so it's good. Relate to that. Right? <laughs> Um, we'll go for three guests, living or dead, that you would invite out for a point. Right. I have a phrase that I always say, if I wouldn't have coffee with you, I wouldn't have lunch with you, and I wouldn't play golf with you. So I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, who would I have as my ideal four ball, but as a pint? Uh, Actually, we'll, we'll change it to four ball, though. Four we'll ball. cater to the guest. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, although the pint is probably good, who you'd have for, for a pint. But Actually, we'll start off with what would be the point of choice for yourself? I would drink... I, I, I only drink once a week since Christmas and I'm off chocolate since New Year's Eve so Patrick's Day had to be Pint of Guinness okay. so I like a Pint of Guinness um, or a bottle of Heineken so okay. the wedding was a bottle of Heineken but Pint of Guinness have you tried the alcohol or sorry the Heineken Zero yes well not bad yeah not bad at all the general consensus. yeah it's not yeah. bad the only thing I would say is from a calorific point of view if I'm going to drink but if you were drinking and driving obviously you wouldn't drink the drive mm -hmm. but or if you were if driving you were. the Heineken Zero has a nice taste okay. about it. yeah it's good you could see yourself sitting down if you if you were you driving could, yeah and, and you, you would have a couple yeah whereas the Erdinger and stuff like that can it's the bloatability it's very factor. gassy the Erdinger very gassy yeah. Yeah. it was like when I went off alcohol in, in January went out one night for dinner with my wife and a couple of friends and I decided to go sparkling water for the night <laughs> never again <laughs> you know I needed a pin prick at the end but who guess at the moment I, I suppose if we went for the point Alex Ferguson would have to be there Oops. yeah definitely have to be there I'd say he'd be more the uh, glass of wine type of man he probably would yeah. well I'd buy him whatever he wanted <laughs> yeah. I'd a big one um, Bono okay yeah and um, see him as a kind of a whiskey man I think. yeah probably and let's say uh, who would be the fourth? My gosh! So I've got a sporting one. Um, I think Joe Schmidt would add an awful lot to it because he's a good personality, you know. Yeah. So maybe we go crack on beer, though, like. Maybe not. Maybe not. No, you probably run a. I feel like him and Ferguson would get a bit competitive trying yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. throw in Freddie Mercury in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Might have a good blast. Good crack there. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and Gavin, you can. Right, Ken, so we always end the show by asking our guests, what's the best piece of advice you've been given or that you could pass on to someone else? I think we said it earlier on. I think the only thing I can change about you is me. And I, I deal with people like I deal with my emails. I either deal with them, I delegate them to somebody else, or I dump them all together. And as I've gone through life, uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoy reading um, the, our friend what's Clive Woodward's book, Winning. And it's still a great book. You pick it up for a euro, but you get rid of the energy sappers. And I think there are people in life that, you know what, I realised that when I did my degree, I thought getting a degree would realise, oh, your management and aptitudes were going to be completely, you know, changed and, and transformed with this piece of paper. People are dicks. No great management training can get rid of them. 
you've just got to get rid of them or change them. So I think the only thing I can change about you is me, get rid of energy sappers, and today is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday and it didn't happen. Brilliant. Well, thanks for your ends, definitely. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, Ken, thanks a million for Pleasure. Coming. Colin, thanks very much. Gavin, Good Gent, morning. thanks very much, Greg. No that was great. This has been In Conversation with Ken Robinson. Thank you very much for listening and we'll see you next time. Perfect. While we have, while we're still recording? No, I want to... Reset it? Yeah.